Irish tradition. Uh, it's for good luck. for good luck. So I'm just an Irish. Oh my word. I thought of you this morning and I was like, hey, I saw this hat and so I'll put it here. I'm not going to wear it. No. No. <laughs> Don't you just love family? <laughs> oh, you look Irish. Yeah, hey, Irish. <laughs> so cool. Let's just raise our hands to Suze. She's a one of our own. She's an amazing person, and uh, she's got an amazing, amazing family. She has to deal with Ellen all the time, but she, she's full of grace. And uh, now let's just raise our hands. Can we do that? Just because it's quite intimidating coming up, standing up front here. We just need all the support we can. So an amen and, you know, during the preach doesn't hurt. And so let's agree <laughs> with her. Feel free. <laughs> uh, cause she spent time with God, and uh, let's just trust God just really does something into our hearts. Is that good? So, Lord, we come, we do, we thank you for Susie. We thank you for her heart, God. We thank you that she loves you so much. She, she adores you, God. And as she shares you, I pray, Father, that um, her words will be your words. And, uh, Lord, that it will be a ripe sermon, Father. It will be a ripe message to us. And I just pray for nerves or anything like that, God, that you'll look at that hat and just realize, Lord, that you are good luck. And, uh, and uh, yeah, we just bless her, bless this time, and we bless the tithes and offerings. We thank you um, for that, Father, that we can give our best to you. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, you guys. Well, my life group were teasing me on Thursday, and I said, well, I've got a long version and a short version. So if it's a long version, I'm going to have to talk quickly, and if it's a short version that I go with, it's like I have to talk slowly. Guys, it's the long version. <laughs> so here we go. Yeah, um... We're into week two of Living to Count, and Nick gave us some really good teaching last week on just hearing from God, getting our hearts quiet before Him, and just listening to Him speak to us. And today, I'm going to be talking about abiding, um, abiding in Him. And the word abiding is one of those words that loses its deeper meaning in translation. But basically, it means to remain, to tarry, to dwell, to continue to be present. To abide in God is a call to stay in His love, stay in His word, stay in obedience. It's to continue doing whatever is being done when it's hard. And the urge to quit is almost too much. I love that one. When we abide in God, it's not yielding to the world around us, but we stand firm and we are immovable in our walk with Him. What struck me the most about Nick's preach last week was that it's a heart thing. Um, our hearts longing to hear from God. Our hearts longing to be in relationship with Him. Above all else, and you need to hear this, God's heart is longing, is longing to be in relationship and friendship with us. He wants to abide with us. It's like this. That's what He wants um, our relationship to be. And a, a common passage that we all kind of turn to when we think of abiding is John 15. And it's where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Um, he who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. But I really felt God take me to another scripture. And it's in Exodus 33. Um, and I've had so much fun just going through this. So will you turn with me to Exodus 33? And I'll just fill you in quickly on what's gone down before before we get to our story. Um, in Exodus 32, basically Moses has gone up um, to the mountain and he has gone to fetch the Ten Commandments. He leaves Aaron at the bottom with all the people and Moses is up the mountain and he gets delayed and I'm sure just thoroughly enjoying being in God's presence. Um, the people come to, Moses, uh, to Aaron and they say, we need some gods to lead us. We don't know what's happened to this Moses. And I love it because they say this Moses. And actually that Moses was the guy that took them out of Egypt, took them through the Red Sea, and he's just like, this Moses. Um, and Aaron, feeling the pressure of leading, <laughs> says to them, give me all your gold jewelry, and we chuck it in the fire. And out came this golden calf. 
amazingly. In his words, out popped this golden calf, just like that. Moses comes down from the mountain, and he is so angry with the people. He smashes the Ten Commandments that God had given him, and they sort everybody out and actually kill a few people, which is a bit gross. But they, they get everybody sorted up, and they, and they keep going. And so we're going to pick up the story in chapter 33. And I'm going to read quite a bit, but I'll read quickly because this is the long version. <laughs> the Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt. I love that. <laughs> All of a sudden they're Moses' people, they're not God's. Um, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your, offering, uh, to your offspring I will give it. I will send you an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Parasites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But I will not go among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and, they put, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments, that I might know what to do with you. Therefore, the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments um, from Mount Horeb onwards. Verse 7. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. When Moses was out, uh, went out to, be, to the tent, all of the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he'd gone into the tent. When Moses had entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent and the Lord would speak to Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship at each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. And actually God did. He said he'd send an angel. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and I have also found favor in your sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways, that I might know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. So he kind of gives them back to God. <laughs> and he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And Moses doesn't quite catch that, and he says, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here, out from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom on whom I will show mercy. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see so no man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. That's quite a long passage. But the first thing I wanted to look at today was when we abide in God, what that relationship looks like. And we need to know that God wants to be in relationship with us. He created us to love us and for us to love him back. Um, he wants to meet with us. He wants to talk to, to, talk to us walk with us in the cool of the day like he did with Adam and Eve um, until that all went belly up. And I came across a brilliant illustration of just what God has done for us. And it was, um, and I've mentioned it in the prayer meeting before the service a couple of weeks ago. 
but it was referring to David and Jonathan's friendship and um, what went down between them is a brilliant parallel of what Jesus has done for us. It was customary in their day to exchange cloaks if they had a covenant between two people. And so basically it's saying, um, here's my cloak, um, you become what I am, and the other person would give them your cloak, their cloak, I'm getting all my senses mixed up there, and you become what I am. So, yeah, so there's an exchange of, and you actually become that person. Just think about it for a minute with Jonathan. Just think about what was at stake for Jonathan to give David his cloak. Jonathan was next in line to be king. Jonathan had the riches of the kingdom at his disposal. And his cloak would have been made of the finest linen. It would have been absolutely flawless. And he was willing to take his beautiful, beautiful, flawless cloak and give it to David. David was a shepherd. He probably didn't even own the sheep that he herded. I think they were his dad's. And his cloak was stinky, it was sweaty, it probably even had sheep poo on it. Um, and Jonathan went back to the palace that night, and he didn't go and climb in the shower and take out another royal cloak and put it on. He actually went to dinner that night with that cloak, David's cloak, on him. That's what Jesus has done for us. He's taken our dirty, stinky lives, and he's gone to the cross, and he has given us a cloak of righteousness, a beautiful, flawless cloak that we put on. We have right standing before our Father. We can go into his presence at any time because of what Jesus has done. When he chose to love us, he also chose to be hurt by us. He knew that we would cause him pain. And even despite that, he decided that it was worth it. We need to know that God is affected by us, that he's actually moved by us. There's a French. In verse 11, um, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man to a friend. And now we know that Moses didn't see God's face because it says later in the passage that no one can do that and live. But some of the commentaries that I read suggest that it's like a, a presence to presence, a spirit to spirit. It's like talking to somebody on the telephone and you know them really, really well and you can picture the expressions on their face by the tone of their voice. Moses knew God's expression. There's a willing friendship when we abide in God. There's time spent together. And remember, it's the creator of the universe, the almighty God, who is there's nothing above him. He wants to meet with you. He actually looks forward to spending time with you. How incredible is that? He looks forward to spending time with me. So what makes a friendship closer than any other? Well, there's secrets. <laughs> and I'm not talking about these dark secrets that you just don't want anyone to know. But actually, they're, they're things that a good, good, close friend would know that's not public knowledge. Um, and that's who God is. He knows what's going down in your heart. Another thing about a close friend is that they're in your business. <laughs> and I've got a very dear friend, Di van Eden, <laughs> and she is in my business. So if she's saying, if I'm saying things like, oh, I can't even actually give you an example, but if she hears something that I'm saying that's actually not helpful to me and growing as a Christian, she'll say, excuse me, like, what are you, what are you saying? You know, she'll actually be prepared to butt heads. Um, and at times it's been extremely uncomfortable and extremely irritating, but extremely good for me too. And Jesus calls us his friends in John 15, verses 13 to 15. He says, if you obey me, um, you are my friends, and I will tell you my business. He trusts us with the things most dear to him, the kingdom of heaven. We're in his business. At SGCI, we have a value of friendship before function. And so basically that means um, if you have the most incredible kids' ministry gift and you come walking through our doors, we're not just going to grab you and stick you in that role and tick that off the box and think, okay, that's done and sorted and we'll forget about you. 
yes, we absolutely welcome. We welcome your gifting, your talents um, to come and serve this body. But more importantly to us is you. You as a person and you as a friend. So don't just come on a Sunday and leave before coffee. Have some coffee with us, spend some time with us, and let's be in each other's business because that's how we grow. When God chose to have, a, um, have us as friends, he opened himself to pain. When we stuff up really badly, God is affected by it. Verse 3 um, tells us that the Israelites were stiff-necked, they were rebellious, they were stubborn, and in that state, they couldn't come into God's presence because his holiness would have just completely consumed them. And I always thought it was, when I read that passage, I always thought it was like God just saying, I can't even look at you right now. You're like, you know, really. It's like a parent when they've got a really naughty, naughty child. And that's not Zach, um, maybe Josh and Aaron. But when they, they come in and you are so angry with them and you say to them, best you go into your bedroom and you stay there for a very long while. Um, otherwise, I'm going to take, take your head off your shoulders. I always thought it was that with God. And actually, it's not. It's not like that. Maybe just a little bit, I'm sure. <laughs> But God's actually saying, because of my holiness, because of who I am and my consuming fire, you cannot actually come into my presence in the state you're in. And so I want to say to you today, don't be stiff-necked, don't be stubborn, and don't be rebellious. He's actually saying to them, stay out of my presence, because otherwise I will destroy you. Um, and if we want to abide in him, we cannot be stiff-necked. We cannot be stubborn. We need to humble ourselves and repent. And God says, uh, or James writes in James, uh, James writes about God saying, um, he gives grace to the humble and he resists the proud. I don't know about you, but I really don't want to have God working against me. Okay, so let's move on to the tent of meeting. Um, if we look at this tent, it's actually quite incredible. But Moses goes out, and the people stand and watch him. Um, they stand at their tent doors, and they watch him worship. How often are we prepared to do that? Where we actually prepared to watch our leaders go before God and hear what God has to say, and we prepare to spectate. That's not what God wants. He wants each and every one of us to meet with him. We need to take responsibility for our own relationship with God. When we hit hard times, and those hard times aren't short-lived, it's not a week, but it might go on for a year, maybe even two, next relationship with God isn't going to cut it for us. It's our abiding in Him. It's our digging our own wells that's going to get us through. It's what God has built in, into us that's going to get us through. It's those times of revelation of every day spending time talking to Him, hearing what he's saying, and then remembering what he said and walking in it. Um, I had a net on my heart a few weeks ago, and Monday turned into Tuesday, Tuesday turned into Wednesday and Thursday, and then we were standing at Life Group, and I said, oh, Ned, I'm so sorry, I haven't phoned you. have been on my heart the whole week, but I haven't phoned you. And she turned to me and she said, oh, don't worry, Jesus has been looking after me. And Ned doesn't stand at her tent door. I don't want to embarrass you, but anyway. I'll just go ahead. And Ned doesn't stand at her tent door. She goes and she meets with her friend, her savior, her God, every single morning and comes out to face the day. Abiding in God is a daily discipline. It's manna from heaven. Um, it's fresh every day. The Israelites had to get out of their tent. They had to put sandals on and they had to go and collect the manna outside their tent. They couldn't just lie there and expect it just to, to be fed. They actually had to get up and do it. They had to get up and get out. And we have an incredible feast of the most amazing manna from God when we are prepared to actually get up, put our sandals on, and go meet with him. It takes discipline. And Nick preached last week about going through the narrow gate and that we're intentional about the kingdom. And... We are created to become like Christ, and it takes effort. 
And I just found these scriptures that were absolutely amazing. Luke 13, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Romans 14, make every effort to do, uh, to, to do what leads to peace. Ephesians 4, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Hebrews 12, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. 2 Peter, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. We need to make every effort to meet in the tent of meeting with our Lord. And that's how we grow, grow in Christ. So when we abide in God, the relationship is one of friendship. It's where we meet him, where he chooses to be affected by us, and where we take responsibility for it. And then point number two, when we abide in him, we experience his presence. And if we look at, back at the beginning of the chapter, um, God says to Moses, you go with your people to the land I've promised you. I'll give you the milk and honey. I'll give you the land. I'll give you an angel to drive out all your enemies. I'll give you everything you need. I'm just not going with you. What would your answer be? If God promised to bless you, to answer every single prayer, you didn't have to worry financially, you didn't have to worry about your business, you didn't have to worry about your family, you didn't have to worry about your marriage, God would bless you, but he wasn't there. What would your answer be? Do we choose God's presence over his blessing? Moses absolutely freaks out, and he realizes that life would not be worth living. And if he didn't have God's presence, he knew he couldn't actually carry on. And he, doesn't, he gets himself into such a tiz in this passage that he actually doesn't even hear God say, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And um, actually that means my presence will go with you and dispel your anxiety. How amazing is that? that that's what God's saying. My presence will go with and dispel your anxiety. He knows, Moses knows, that the presence of God is life. If God asked us to carry on without him, would we say, no way, no way, no deal? God's created us with a need to be with him and a need to be with people. And if we confuse the need to be with people and the need for things over God, that's idolatry. And we look at the Israelites here in this passage and we think, oh my word, how could they have done that? How could they have done that? You know, given all their gold jewelry and stuck it in a fire and worshipped a, a, a cow. But we actually do exactly the same. We do. When we choose his blessing over his presence. David says, do anything to me. Just don't take your presence away from me. And then abiding in him and his presence distinguishes us. In verse 16, he says, if you don't go with us, we won't be distinguished as your people. And I think sometimes we all have a thing in us that we need to be significant in some way. And if we don't keep that in check, we, we find ourselves getting into a bit of trouble. But if we want our lives to count, and this is what the series is on, we need to be distinguished, not by our gifts and our talents and what we can bring, we need to be distinguished by being in God's presence. When you abide in him and in his presence, we shine to the world. And not only to the lost world, but we can actually shine in the body of Christ. And another value of Southern Gateway is the priesthood of all believers. Well, what does that mean? Well, it actually means that as you individually spend time in God's presence, you come and you have something to bring. So if you have a prophetic word, and we had a brilliant example of the priesthood this morning, of people coming forward and, and actually have been in his presence and are coming to share something with us, God spoke. You're the missing piece of the puzzle if you don't come. You bring a prophetic word, you bring a scripture, you pray during worship, you need to bring it. You need to bring it, the priesthood of all believers. And then number three, when we abide in God, we see his glory. In verse 17, Moses says, show me your glory. 
show me. Show me. I need to know that you're with me. And that word in Hebrew, glory, is kabod. Uh, Janine, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but anyway. Which means weightiness, value, that which makes you God alone. And Moses is saying, show me your glory. That thing that makes you God alone. Show me, I want it. Look at verse 19 and 22. Uh, Verse 19, God says, I will make my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And verse 22 says, my glory passes by. Um, While, sorry, while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock. And God uses, uses glory and goodness interchangeably. And that's not a mistake. It's actually the same thing. When we're scared to live for God's glory because that it'll cost us too much or it will be painful, we're missing out. We need to know that God's glory, if it's painful, if we suffer, even if we don't, it is always, always good because God is good. Beth Moore um, had this insight and I wanted to share it with you. And she just said, if you're going through your darkest time and um, yeah, you just don't even know that God's there, maybe, just maybe, he has put you in the cleft of the rock and he has covered you with his hand. And he's saying, while you're going through these tough times, my glory and my goodness are going past and I will show you who I am. I am your God, your friend, your covenant maker, your covenant keeper. And when his glory passes by and he lifts his hand and we look behind us, we see, wow, all the things that he has protected us from that we didn't even know were there and we can worship him for his goodness. He is always, always good. The Israelites' sin was so blatant, they were so stubborn and rebellious, that if they hadn't turned and repented, God would have completely consumed them. And if you can relate to that today, if you find yourself being stubborn and rebellious, if people and things have taken the place of God, God has his hands stretched out to you today. And he's saying, I will make my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim my name before you, the Lord. Yahweh. Won't you respond to him today and make right? Get back into a place of just abiding in him. When we abide in him, there's a willing friendship. When we abide in him, we experience his presence. And when we abide in him, we see his glory. Amen. Just pray. Yeah, oh, Father, we come before you today and we just, we're just so overwhelmed by the fact that you want to meet with us and we worship you, Lord. We thank you that you look forward to seeing us every morning, that your steadfast love never ceases and that your mercy is on you every day. Father, I pray that our hearts would be turned to you And that we would find ourselves putting on our sandals and coming into your presence. We thank you for your presence, Lord God. We thank you that we can abide in you no matter what we are going through, Lord God. That you are there for us. Not for what you can do, but for who you are. We worship you today, Lord. Amen.